Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. You've definitely tasted their sweetness. You probably have felt their sting. They're kind of buzzing all about the news, and they have been for the past two decades. That's right, the bee. The bee that gives us life. They help pollinate fruits, vegetables. They help humanity keep on going. And Albert Einstein even said, if the bee disappears from the surface of the earth, man would have no more than four years to live. Today we're going to be talking about the disappearing bees, and how bees affect us, how we affect the bees, and... All the buzzing and noise that's going around about the disappearing bees. So Nick, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm ready to butt heads a little bit on this one. It should be a good one. Yeah, I uh, I imagine certain topics about talking about these bees we are uh, we're gonna disagree upon, but that's okay. That's what this is all about. Just a friendly debate with some uh, some cold drinks and good friends. That's the way it's got to be. Yep. So while researching honeybees, I want to point out some just some interesting facts. I didn't know that honeybees, you know, first came to the U.S. in 1622. I guess I'd never thought about it before, but they've been part of human culture for longer than I think most people realize. At the time they came over, they were kept in, they were called skeps, and it was basically just a rope curled around, and the bees would be inside, and then when they wanted to harvest it, they just uncurled a rope, which is pretty crazy, but imagine that you're crossing the Atlantic, with a bunch of bees on your boat like they brought bees to the new world on boats they had to care for them that whole way and at one point uh during colonial times you know people had a honeybee colony on their house on the south side or south aspect so it faces the sun for the majority of the day a couple different cultures did and that was something that was seen as common you know, much like a lot of things in our modern life, we went away from that. But it's crazy to think that something that very rarely do you want to run into today was such a common practice back then. I don't know about you, Nick, but doing a months upon months long journey of a rickety boat across the Atlantic Ocean with bees does sounds like a very, very stressful time. And I, uh, it definitely makes me nervous. And like Nick pointed out, they came in 1622. So for here in America, when you think the common honeybee, like the bee you see in the cartoons or the bees you see on your cereal, the ones that you imagine, those are not native. They were induced here into the Americas. But over the entire world, there are over more than 20,000 known bee species in the world. And some suspect there could be even a couple hundred or a couple thousand more that still have yet to be discovered. So bees, as Nick said, have been tied into our history, our community, throughout all of humanity, ever since we stopped becoming hunting and gatherers. I mean, hell, probably even when we were hunting and gatherers, collecting honey is probably a main reason why humans survived and flourished. I know some tribes, such as the pygmies in West Africa, still relish at getting some honey like they just absolutely love it but as humanity progresses forward the bees seem to have taken a dip from 1947 to 2005 an extreme notice of bees disappearing started to be recorded and at that time period beekeepers lost nearly 50 percent of their bees and it didn't end at 2005. In 2006, some bee beekeepers were reporting losses of bees ranging from 30% all the way to 90% of their bees. That's people's livelihood disappearing. And just for reference, most years, bee loss is around 15 to 20%. That's due to, you know, bees getting old, other things eating it, just the cold, but never as high as 90%. But scientists have come up with some reasonings of why all these bees are disappearing. And me and Nick are going to be talking about this throughout the podcast. And I'm not sure if we mentioned it already, but bees disappearing is called the Colony Collapse Disorder, the CCD. 
It's a massive amount of bees dying or disappearing. And now they're dying in a record rate. But it's not too late to turn the tide. And hopefully we'll discuss a few solutions and a few possibilities to help fix the bees solution from not disappearing in this world. Yeah, so I think it's important to talk about why bees are important. Uh, I think most people probably know, but bees pollinate plants and plants provide food, basically is what it is. So commercial bee industry, the majority of their income comes from taking their bees, loading them up on a truck and driving them to California to fertilize, or not fertilize, to pollinate the almonds, the almond fields down there. All the way from, you know, the eastern U.S. to closer states to that, these farmers will load up all their honeybees on the back of a semi, strap them in, and drive them down there, and then charge prices per colony. And that's how these almonds get, fer- get uh, pollinated. I keep trying to say fertilize there. Get pollinated so that they can, you know, produce fruit. Yes, it's if I'm not mistaken, it's nearly half of all the bees in united states go to and travel to those almond uh, plantations to help pollinate those plants Uh, i believe currently there's about 4.2 million bees being grown as a livestock of course there are wild bees that aren't counted into that but those perhaps are the most affected from the ccd but uh yeah as nick said most majority just about half go to california just to produce almonds which seems a little off and a little weird to me nick it doesn't seem like that's the best solution so what are what's your opinion and feelings on the almonds well i think uh i think we've talked about a little bit before but i don't necessarily know if irrigating the entire state of california to produce the food we need is the perfect solution but consumers demand access to crops year-round, and that's how we got to get it to them. So until we change the culture of all these different foods year-round the U.S., we're going to be stuck with that. Um, So I don't think that's going to change, but you have to imagine if you bring all the bees to a central location, they're going to spread that disease, and they're going to take it back to wherever they're coming from. Yes, and uh, just to alliterate, the reason why people don't just leave the bees there is because the bees can't survive there. They can only survive for the almond season. There are no other plants where they can pollinate, they can survive off of. That's why they're imported from across the United States to that location. And before we get a little bit too far away from it, as Nick said, how important bees are, one-third of the world's crops, one third of 7 billion people's crops depend on beads. And that number is increasing every year. There are some studies saying that uh, there's gonna be 300% increase in uh, world crop uh, production and bees are gonna be needed more than ever, which is amazing to think about. But sticking with the almonds, I I don't like, well, we'll talk a little bit more about problems that uh, these bees are facing, like Nick pointed out, diseases, uh, bacteria, viruses, mites, stress, different, uh, just lack of environment and food. But sticking with the almonds a little bit, since that's a huge industry, I thought maybe less than the almond market. So you still have your almonds 24-7 around the year, but less trees. So I believe almonds grow on trees, I could be mistaken. If we set a small portion of that land to weeds and flowers that bees like and pollinate, we wouldn't have to import them. Now, this might affect the farmers. I mean, some might have to be imported, but it could be a beneficial to have a localized, sustainable ecosystem for the farmers, which I'm definitely a strong component for of less modification and more naturalization which I can see me and Nick might disagree about because Nick, I think, I I don't want to speak for you, but I think you want to say whatever the market is, the market supplies. I mean, the farmers are going to do what the market wants, but I don't know if that's the right solution. Maybe we have to think more generational and less short-term. But I could be mistaken. I, again, am not into agriculture or farming, 
I am a lonely engineer who likes machines. Well, I think the problem you're running into, I'm sure there's local bee populations there, but I think the amount of plants you have in that concentrated area can't possibly be fertilized by local populations, which is why you have to bring in outside populations because they're so dense. I mean, think about, I don't know, they're probably doing something close to, uh, I want to say like 13 by, so 13 feet apart for each tree. And I don't know exactly how many, you know, I think every flower has to be pollinated. So every flower on that tree. So I think the problem is local populations aren't enough to handle the amount of production that's going on, which is why you bring it in. I mean, it is an insane amount of bees that are brought in to do all that pollination. So I, I think it's just that, you know, the, the problem is even if they're, like you said, the bees, they go there and they do pollinate. So it's not that they're, they can't pollinate those trees. I think it is a matter of t like the amount of trees that need to be pollinated in a short amount of time is part of the problem. You made me think of two interesting points. One, I want to clarify, when I said 2 million bees, I misspoke. It's 2 million bee hives, and each bee hive can have around twenty to 30,000 bees. So it's 4.2, 4.6, somewhere, somewhere in 4 million bee hives in the United States, and about half of those bee hives are transported into the, the almond plantations. But, Nick, I want to clarify, when I was researching, I don't know, you maybe came across something different, but I noticed... There was no cover crop. There was no weeds. There was no flowers. There was a lot of ground to me when looking at the plantations that could allow those flowers or weeds. Now, granted, it might cost more in nutrients, but with more flowers, more weeds, more sustainability for the bees, so you wouldn't have to import the bees. And to me, that it seems like you're only looking for one crop when we've talked about in earlier episodes of the podcast of the three sisters, the beans, the corn, the squash. Maybe it's the same solution. Have some weeds, some flowers, bees, and the almonds. I think that be a possible solution. Well, you you're you kind of hit on it, but not exactly the right limiting factor. So your limiting factor isn't nutrients there. It's something much more expensive in California, water. When you start adding all these different plants into that closed system, that system there, you're going to have to put a lot more water on the ground which if you know anything about california they're not exactly uh loaded with water and water is an expensive commodity and i think what they're finding out is it doesn't pay to water all those plants on top of your trees which can barely survive that ground anyway without irrigation that it pay it's easier to just bring bees in than it is to water the, you know you're essentially trying to make a prairie in a desert is what you're trying to do there it's already hard enough to grow trees, but now you're going to bring in more plants that need more water, that need it closer to the ground. So trees have deeper roots than grass, obviously, but grass uses a ton of water, more so than people probably think. And you're going to need to keep that soil pretty moist. You know, I'm sure most of those pictures you saw is kind of dryish, cracked soil, kind of a dusty soil. That's not exactly the most, uh, the best soil for holding water in it so i think that's your issue i don't think it's a fertilizer issue or anything like that i think it's there's not enough water for that area to supply both the trees and your understory well this this might be a dumb question uh i don't know plants that well but could we use a weed or flower that a is positive for the bees that could help store the water so it doesn't not it's not wasted so yes i imagine the trees soak up most of it but i imagine there's still some that they miss so even even just a little bit would probably help but to me when i didn't think about the water at all that's that completely slipped my mind but when now that i think about it, it's like if you can't sustain it maybe not do it like uh, having that crop that We've discussed before that if the market wants, that's what the farmers are going to grow. But again, I, maybe that's not the best solution. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't think we need to be watering a bunch of, you know, 
I, I'm against almond milk. I mean, I guess that's what this is about. You're against almond milk. Putting that on the record. Good to know. Good to know. No, but it's it's that's a that's a whole nother issue. I mean, what now you're gonna tell these people they can't grow their farm that who knows how long they've had it. It's just uh, it's a can of worms you're opening up here, Mike. I'm not saying they can't grow it like how they want it, but maybe there's another way or more beneficial way that they can grow it. You know, a higher up front cost, but in the long term ben- more beneficial. That's my thinking. But it's not just almonds that bees affect, like we mentioned it earlier, but it's something that most of the Americans here drink, coffee. And I would like to switch it up a little bit and talk a little bit about coffee. Coffee in the United States, well, in 2015, this study said, $225 billion industry, with being responsible for nearly 1,700,000 jobs. And I hate to admit it, people, but the bees fall, so does the coffee. I'm a coffee lover myself, but bees are a majority pollinator for coffee. And if bees keep disappearing like they're disappearing, the coffee prices are going to go up. And we might not have the coffee every day that we love. And I was wondering, Nick, did you come across any research when uh, researching on the bees about coffee? No, most of what I saw was pertaining to, to almonds and organic bee production for, for honey. See, when I, I was more... For coffee, it wasn't more about the pollination for me. It was more the economics of it. I don't think people realize how much bees, the small little livestock, quote-unquote, uh, is important to the world. It helps produce commodities that we love. It helps create jobs that many people need. I mean, 1,700,000 jobs is because of coffee. And that doesn't happen without bees. Bees are a stepping stone for all of it to happen. And it was fascinating when researching this how tied in bees are to the economy. If bees fall, the economy falls. Or at least uh, things raise in price which was quite interesting to see and i imagine it's the same with almond milk if the bees are all disappearing it's gonna be hard to sell cheap almond milk your favorite thing to drink nick i'm definitely gonna send you a lot of almond milk for your uh for your wedding i'm moving (laughs) oh i'll behave don't worry about it yeah no i i'm not at all anyway saying that bees aren't economically important or ecologically important i think all of us have seen the picture uh out of china or the pictures of them hand pollinating in their parks you know the woman bending down with the q-tip taking pollen from one plant putting it in another that's got to be terrible have you seen the one with them in the trees no i haven't they they are having all right for what nick is talking about is man-made pollination so they're taking paintbrushes and transferring pollen so a little biology lesson uh for those who don't know plants can't walk surprising enough they're rooted into the ground so in order to pollinate which is to breed a female with a male which is their pollen to create more offspring they either a induce the wind to help them pass around their pollen and seed or b they have insects or other species help move that pollen around to the males and females to help uh, help breed to help keep their gene line going but when the bees are gone there's really not insects can do that i mean beetles can do it butterflies can do it but bees are the workhorses bees are the ones who get it done and in countries like china where some bees don't like the plants or bees simply aren't there they are hiring people to take paintbrushes collect pollen on the paintbrushes and introduce them to others and one image i came across was yes i saw the old lady bending over which is hilarious to me nick but one guy climbing a tree all the way to the top of the tree like this had to be easily a 20 foot tree and paintbrushing the flowers at the end of the tree to pollinate it and it looked so dangerous and so sketchy to me. It was it was so weird to see. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, China, they lost most of their bees because of terrible air quality. 
At least that's what I read. I don't know if you ran into something else, Mike. No, what I uh, overall what I saw, which I assume we'll talk about more throughout the podcast, is the main reason bees are disappearing is just humans. Humans are the uh, to me the main cause of the bees disappearing uh, all throughout the world, both the United States, China, and other countries. We're not the only countries dealing with it. Lots of countries in Europe, such as Spain, Italy, France, Poland, Germany. Our neighbors here in Canada, they're also all having problems with bees disappearing. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think we may disagree from what I've read. It seems like the bee population is increasing throughout the world, but it is decreasing in the United States. And I think it's could be partially due to a couple different things. And I'm not saying colony collapse disorder or varroa mites, which is one of the causes and a couple of different diseases which we're, we'll get into later is a driver but i think a lot of it has to do with um i don't know if you came across this as well but talking to one of my buddies who is a commercial bee grower he's saying that honey production is it's a side effect basically of pollen pollinizing i don't even know if i use that term right anyway um, pollinization going down to pollinate pollinate that's the word i'm looking for so they go down and pollinate the almonds uh, like most commercial bee producers and they collect honey as you know they don't make as much money from it he said sometime in the 70s 80s that's when everything switched at that point honey production was the number one economic driver of bees but then sometime around there um, it switched over to doing all the pollinization work turned into economic driver and now honey production is the second they they produce honey so naturally they're going to try and sell it but they don't really get a great price for it now what's weird is honey production in the united states has gone down but honey production has increased throughout the world as well as honey consumption so kind of what i was seeing is that a lot of bee production has moved out of the united states into other places and they're importing it because it's maybe cheaper to grow or I don't exactly know why and it's kind of it doesn't seem like there's so China produces the most honey in the world is the leading producer of honey followed by Turkey and then Argentina the US is um, is six in the world and it's kind of been their honey production has been going down bee population has stayed about the same for a while and it's declined and gone up and declined and gone up for the last 10 years or so so i don't know if we're looking at we're i mean i think we are we're looking at a bunch of different factors from different uh, pesticides to mites diseases and you know they took our jobs <laughs> there's there's bees out there that took our jobs <laughs> See, I agree with there are multiple reasons. I don't think the colony collapse disorder is one simple cause. But going through that, I think it's majority human's fault. And I want to make an asterisk. I want to clarify between me and you before we continue. See, you say bees are increased. See, I see honeybees, the classic European bees that were, came to America that are now being transported all over the world, increasing. But the wild bees, the more natural bees, the environment, the native bees, a heavy, heavy decline. Like in the last 120 years, about 50% of all bee species have gone extinct. That seems to line up with the Industrial Revolution. Just a very interesting fact because I believe, I could be wrong, that destroying their environment, removing the flowers, removing, because bees are, uh, is contrary to belief, are very complicated creatures. They need a complex diet. So the pollen for them are, are super high in protein. That's why they love it. Nectar is like a sweet bonus. Not necessary, but it's definitely they'll definitely take it. But it seems that wild bees, now not having the same land, the same flowers, having to compete in smaller areas. We'll talk about farmlands in a little bit that the wild bees are suffering, but the honeybees, the more traditional classic bees, are 
steady, if that makes sense. So when you say bees are increasing, are you talking about those honeybees or are you talking about bees in general? I'm talking about agricultural bees. Agricultural bee populations are increasing. So for the agricultural, are you talking about bees here in the United States that people take to pollinate? So this would be any any bee any bee owner with five or more hives. So whether that be a small organic farm with five hives that just sells on the side of the road kind of deal, which is pretty common here in Oregon, but the majority of those are going to be uh, production down in um, the almonds or other places for pollinizing. So I'm assuming you're talking just about the American honeybee. If by American honeybee you mean American honeybee, German honeybee, and European honeybee. The one that was transferred yes. over from so the, Europe. There's, yes. So honeybees, or sorry, bees, much like any other species, I don't know, species, any group, I mean, it's, it's, think of honeybees like fish, okay? There's a lot of different kinds of fish. You're all going to call them a fish, but there's a very vast difference between, say, like a largemouth bass and a rainbow trout. Honeybees are very similar. There's tons of different kinds of bees. Some are more solitary. Some have hives. They behave differently. They produce different things. And even in Oregon alone, I think there's like 63 different species of bees. Now, we touched on this in our Invasive Species podcast and earlier in this podcast about people bringing in different species. The most common species in the U.S. is the um, European honeybee. The German honeybee up north was brought in because it can survive hardier temperatures, whereas I believe it's a European one that was brought in because it's a little bit gentler, but it can't survive those colder temperatures. And I'm sure we've all heard of the African honeybee, which has worked its way up from South America, but is kind of hanging out down in the southern states, Mexico, Central America, to South America, that is a little bit more aggressive. So we have a lot of different factors affecting our native American honeybee populations, and not the least of those is competition for habitat from invasive species. So going back a little bit, when you said that farmers... Uh, like the, the farmers bringing in bees to pollinate the almond fields. Traditionally, from what I saw in my research, they were those European bees, that European honeybees that were brought to America that the, the Americans grow. And I want to make sure that we're talking about the right same bee. Because I was talking about how wild bees, more native bees, are heavily, heavily, heavily being declined, much more than the native European bee not native European bee, the bee that was brought over here from European honeybee, which is spreading out through the world, which is increasing, or at least may a mellow baseline. Okay, so we were we were talking about two separate species. I think we figured it out. No, definitely the native bee population is declining. And I, I, I think the native bee uh, population is declining is uh, m- multiple factors, but I think the main factor is humans which we'll discuss in a little bit. But since you brought it up, you're talking about the mites. And those mites are just nasty on what they are blood-sucking creatures that are just destroying bees, both the European honeybee and pretty much all bees here in America. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Mike's talking about the Varroa destructor mites. Love the name of it. Aptly, I know, right? Um, and they, they, bees can handle them in populations. There are small levels of population. It's not going to completely shut down the hive. But once you start getting into a higher population of mites, then it causes the colony to, it, it, the bees figure out that they're infected. So they try and flee the hive. But at that point, it's too late. And it ends up that the, the bees end up all dying. Bees are very graceful, I've noticed, when dying. They tend to just, leave the hive, go wander off and die, which is quite noble to sacrifice yourself for the good of the hive, but it's also making it very hard for scientists to get accurate data of bees dying from mites and diseases, bacteria, viruses, because they'll just go off and die. This is also a little fun fact that I think you'll enjoy, Nick, is the mite, the 
the Varian Destructor is a invasive species here in the United States. Yep, I I saw that, and I think it first came in Florida, which doesn't surprise anyone. Um, but imagine being a a beehive, or what it's an apiarist, apiar, apiarist. Oh, you're Mr. Fancy over there. They have well, beekeepers are fancy people, from what I understand. Imagine going out to your your beehive and you're going to check it for whatever reason and next thing you know like there's nothing there like there's no bees left and for the longest time these these beehive owners these apiarists i can't i gotta double check i'm saying that right they were calling the uh fish and game department of the interior saying my bees are gone like they're disappeared and they were the the agency was used to getting calls like that and it being nothing for so they didn't really believe them for a little bit and they finally went out and looked at it and like where'd all your bees go like i've never seen this before they're actually all gone like there's not a single bee left in this hive yeah and uh i think it's very important because it kind of ties it together nick you were talking about how bees can't survive certain climates and a lot of bees for the winter months are transported as well transported transported from northern states to southern states, such as Texas, Florida, uh, Georgia, those kind of states. And that's where a lot of the infection of mites happen in those warmer climates, which is quite interesting to think that you could store your bees for the winter in a different state, such as Florida, and the mites will just devastate them, make them a whole hive disappear, just just vanish out of thin air. It's It's scary to think about. Yeah, and some farmers have taken to basically creating a greenhouse or storing their bees inside for the winter so that they don't expose them to diseases and mites down south where you have concentrated bees from other landowners and other beekeepers that may or may not have been exposed to these viruses and parasites and mites and who knows what. I'm I'm happy you brought up greenhouses. I actually came across a, it's a little bit off topic, but... Uh, I I actually thought it was a hilarious story is the amount of bees being used with tomatoes in greenhouses is it, it is hilarious to watch people hand pollinate tomatoes. So for those who don't know, tomato flowers, they're they need vibrations in order to open them up to spread their pollen, stuff like that. And some people pretty much made like homemade vibrators to open up the plants so they can pollinate each other and it's it's very interesting machinery but the good old bumble oh i'm sure it is <laughs> oh nick you love a good vibrator don't lie but uh <laughs> uh bumblebees naturally vibrate at like a c frequency i think in the musical note which opens up the tomatoes and because of that greenhouses that grow tomatoes are importing and having bees by the dozen because a they do the work for them the bees they they don't have to use a vibrator to vibrate tomato plants so they can pollinate bees naturally do it better and a, a study showed that bees naturally doing it versus a person introducing the pollination the bees did a better job and a more successful rate and have a better harvest because of it. And it kind of shows you that nature does it better. Sorry about the little side story. You just you said greenhouses and just remind me a little bit about it, uh, about vibrators and bumblebees. What a <laughs> what an interesting story. Yeah, I'm never going to ask you about that again. Um, <laughs> but what uh, I think we were talking about is all the different ways people are getting around that because people realize that these mites are very detrimental to their population. And I wanted to talk about um, IPM or integrated pest management. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am not. Could you explain a little bit? Because I actually have no idea what that is. Okay. So it's nothing a special. Uh, it's not just for bees. It's for pretty much any kind of management, natural resources, I guess, when you have a problem like this so it's a it's a system of any it's integrated pest management it's basically 
the response to stimuli at, at its simplest. So what you do is you figure out what pest populations could affect your crop. For example, for bees, this is going to be varroa mites. Now, varroa mites are a lot harder to... You have to actually sample. You can't just look and see if there's mites. I mean, if you can look and see that there's mites, you're you're pretty well fucked. <laughs> um, so you want to catch them way before that. So what you do is you set up some kind of monitoring program where you take, like, we'll use the bee example. You're going to take 100 bees, and then you put them in a jar, and you shake, all, shake them, and all the mites will fall off them onto something white. And then you can count the mites because you, you can see them with the naked eye. And then you can say, okay, there's like one or two mites that it's an issue that we have to monitor. If it gets worse, we'll address it. And so you kind of know where your population is. And you're, you're also preemptively trying to prevent any, any uh, damage to your crop. So before you, you know, at the beginning of your season, you're going to treat for mites you're going to do something to prevent the risk to your bees. You're going to keep them in a greenhouse. You're not going to send them down south. And then you got to continue to monitor them. And then say you have a problem. So say you have three mites. You're at the point, three to five mites, it's the point per 100 bees where you're getting to the point where it could be an issue. So you have to figure out, you have to set an, uh, an action threshold. So at some point, it's going to be make financial sense to deal with the mites rather than leave them. So it's basically what's the cost of treating these mites versus what's the cost of losing this hive, and that's something you have to decide. Then finally, control. And once you get to that point where you're going to figure out how to treat the problem, um, that's when you take action. That's your, okay, we're going to treat these mites. Now, the important part of this integrated pest management is the... Uh, population counts monitoring you know if you know what's going on then you can treat it before it becomes an issue or as it's rising so the most important thing that this that one of the basic principles of ipm is the monitoring of what's going on do you want a, a population on your problems on your mites your invasive species whatever it is that you're dealing with basically you can't act with no information so it's more of just understanding what could go wrong and how to deal with it when it does but it's also one of the things about integrated pest management is there's no one solution there's no silver bullet um stephen cook i definitely took that from your lecture so there's your citation right there um <laughs> so it seems to me like it's definitely the cdc of the plant slash insect world yeah, basically, and we use it too in forestry. It's it's more, it's kind of what we're trying to get people to go to because the main idea is if you can identify a problem before it becomes a problem, then you can deal with it for a lower cost than when it, if you wait and let it become a problem. But you also have to monitor, you know, that point where are you saving yourself any money if you, you know, if you have one mite and you go out and treat all of your hives for a mite that's not you're not buying yourself anything you're just wasting your money on uh, a pesticide to get rid of your varroa mite so it's more about understanding what you have in your hive and i think what i'm trying to get into is commercial beekeepers are pretty good at keeping their hives clean now there's a couple different ways they do that like i said there's no silver bullet you're not going to solve it in with just a just a pesticide treatment to kill the varroa mite and one of the most important things is genetics now bees one of the most important things they breed for is hygiene so bees will identify a mite and remove that mite from the colony if they're a hygienic bee some bees are not hygienic they'll wait till it becomes an issue to remove it but at that point it's too late so these people are breeding these queens to produce hygienic bees so that's part of the problem or that's part of the solution sorry another part of the solution like i said is monitoring and when you have mites treating them you know people use different 
depending on your different stage of honey flow, people are going to produce or different stage of where the bee colony is at in its life, apply a different pesticide to that colony to keep the mites out. Now, from what my friend who does this, they said they treat at the beginning of the season and then they'll treat once they get back from California. And so what I'm, I think uh, part of the problem is with varroa mites allowing it to spread is just like anything, you know, the people who are involved in this industry all the time are going to be a lot better at it. People who got into it for the backyard, there seems to be, you know, quite a bit of rivalry between commercial beekeepers and not all of them. I mean, it's not a huge rivalry, but some people I listen to, are, they really went off on these hobby beekeepers, which I kind of understand after seeing some people and how they grow trees. It's it's very inefficient. It's almost better to have not cut at all if that's how you're going to try and reforest. Reforestation is a whole thing in itself. And so, you know, just having a beehive in your backyard, just leaving the bees there, that's not really a solution. That's not, I get that you're trying to do, you're trying to bring bees back, but there's more to being an apiarist and monitoring those bees than just looking at them every day. You're basically, if you put a bunch of bees in your backyard and you don't control for these, like say varroa mites, and they get in there, you're doing a disadvantage. You're allowing these mites to spread over your carelessness. And that's how a lot of these commercial beekeepers see it which is why I bring up the monitoring is that's very important in owning bees. You you made me spring like eight different topics I want to talk about with bees. Uh, like cuz I I found the bee structure hive and how we interact with them quite fascinating and you brought up a lot of points that I want to start breaking down. One, I'd be very curious to see commercial versus hobbyist what bees they have. Are they the same type of bees, same species? Are they, are the hobbyists doing more native bees? Because I know, like, uh, New York City, Vermont, Chicago, uh, I think more, it's more of an East Coast thing, if I remember correctly. They have a whole bee kind of club community, Facebook kind of group thing, where they're trying to bring more bees back, and there are bee growers, but they're specifically targeting native bees to that area. I imagine the commercial bee growers are growing more productive bees such as the european bee which seems to be the workhorse of the bees that we're all familiar with and i also want to address that yeah nick you are right bees tend to be quite clean creatures i know for the queen especially she has her own servants that protect her and clean her and it's usually hard for the mites to get to the queen it's usually more the drones or the workers that get the mites because the cleaners, the, the mites have to go through the workers, then through the cleaners, then to the queen. By the time that gets to the queen, it usually is stopped. And like we said earlier in the discussion is the bees have a tendency to, when they know they're infected or they're a danger to the hive, simply leave and die. Which would make interesting data points to me of how that skews the data of how many infected bees there are so say like you said nick you had 100 bees and three mites showed up well how many already died from that subject or how many flew away and died elsewhere to protect the hive it'd be very interesting to know what those numbers are it, it but stay, staying on the mites a little bit i came across a very optimistic a uh, non-spray solution. Now, I like. I definitely believe that farmers should definitely, like your like your friend does, in the beginning of the season and after they come back from California. I think that's ingenious. I think that's that's bloody clever. But these people have developed and are testing and introduced specialized hive doors. So these hive doors kind of make the bee forced to be rubbed when they come and leave the hive. And they coat these doors with a special chemical that will kill the mites but doesn't affect the bees, which is ingenious to me. So even if the bees are infected, they'll kill the mites and save the, and save the hive, which I thought was ingenious, especially if you're going to do commercialize it. It's a, it's, a, it's a door stopper for the mites, which it's like a bouncer. I, I, I think that was an ingenious idea. 
and I'm not sure of its effectiveness. I don't know if you came across that or any other solutions to the mites besides simply spraying and control. Did you come across any other? Uh, uh, sorry, I brought up a kind of bunch of different top points of the queen and 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 the sample size and and possible solutions for mites. And feel free to address any of those. What what what's your opinion, thoughts, and feelings? So I think there's. There's always, a, a, you know, biological control is, is the best. If we can continue to breed these bees, you know, bees have relatively sure, short uh, turnaround times for, you know, selective breeding that you can rapidly increase your genetic resistance to these mites. So I think that's your first step. That's, that's what you got to work on in the background. But in the meantime, reducing the mite population through... Um, pesticide use is, is going to be your best bet. You're using that pesticide as a crutch while you work on the genetics because genetic genetics is everything. If you can get a bee that the mite doesn't affect anymore, then you don't need to treat with pesticides. I mean, that's, you know, then you're saving that cost. You're not paying for those pesticides every year and you're not a, saving that time. You're not applying them to however many hives you have. So I think that's those two things kind of work hand in hand. Yeah, I can, I agree with that. I'm, when researching the bee disappearing, pesticides were not in the favor of helping bees, from at least what I saw. It was a lot of pesticides, such as, uh, oh, sorry for my pronunciation, I'm not so good with my words, but neon, conti- neonicotinoids. There you go. That's the one. <laughs> Neonix for short. Uh, I'm just going to go with the nicotine-based pesticide, uh, insecticide, sorry. That's uh, that's a lot easier for me to say. But uh, a couple a couple of them came up, like the one from Roundup, which is a... Uh, glyphosate? Glyphosate. Thank, look at you being a forester, knowing your uh, pesticides. You're definitely, definitely a man for the job. But I didn't really see any pesticides to help control the mites. I did, however, come up with a solution, and it might be a dumb solution, but I didn't really see anyone suggest it, but pair bees with ladybugs. Now, now, hear me out before you judge me. Ladybugs, along with bees, have been used in farming for centuries, if not thousands of years. Ladybugs are really good at keeping pests away and controlling the crop to make sure they don't get swarm and eaten by other bugs quite aggressive little creatures and they happen to eat mites and i was wondering why when we introduce bees to an area or pollinate that we aren't also introducing ladybugs it seems like a very win-win situation ladybugs help keep the mites population down bees pollinate the flowers to help flower growth or plant growth or almond growth Ladybugs get the leaves and they get to eat and the cycle continues. And I didn't see anything when researching about that. I've seen ladybugs, like I, I knew growing up that ladybugs were useful for farming and crops and we did it in our backyard garden. But did you ever come about like a symbiotic relationship with bees? Like not just has to be ladybugs, but using other species to help bees i didn't see any other symbiotic relationship with bees which i thought was very curious i feel like nature has very good solutions to its own problems and i I was surprised i didn't see another one i haven't seen it with bees um biological control of pests is always a a hot topic it is very interesting but i don't think the technology is there we've experimented with it a few times in different not I haven't read too much about it, experimental control with bees or biological control, but we've used it, ladybugs, for other things. And it's kind of like, like I said, a Band-Aid. It's more of a temporary help. It doesn't seem like it's a long-lasting solution from what I've seen for using ladybugs to control different plants. Now, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe they, you know, are going to do a number on the mite column, but I haven't seen it play out so i'm uh, it's very interesting it, you know it's such a green idea that not using pesticides everyone's a huge fan of 
But the problem is effectiveness. You know, these farmers, why would you use, say, the ladybug control was, say, even 90% effective. There's a 90% chance you're going to save that hive. Or you use some form of pesticide to kill your mites and you have a 100% chance to save your hive. Well, I feel that the pesticides aren't 100%. Like, you're always getting... Mi- so I think... Okay, so this is where I think... How we had the confusion over the bees, or types of bees, I think we're confused about different kinds of pesticides. So glyphosate is an herbicide that's applied on fields, um, or the farmer's ground. And neonicotinoid, uh, neonix, I believe that's an insecticide. Correct. So... Uh, From what I talked to my friend who does the commercial bee production, they have a conversation with their farmers because those, those grow, the, I don't know, the apiarist, apiarist, I believe it is, the bee producers, they know what chemicals are going to hurt their bees. And they have an agreement to not spray and have, to not spray before their bees are there or while their bees are there so that they spray long enough before that they're, it's not a restricted entry interval for that they're able to settle in long enough so that they don't impact the bees. And that comes down to communication. Now I can tell you from firsthand, this is just anecdotal evidence. I haven't really researched it. We do an herbicide treatment every year um, or not every year, you know, once we harvest right before we plant, we'll do a site preparation treatment where we kill competing brush to allow trees to, get a foothold they get access to more water more nutrients and once they have that foothold from that first year killing the competing brush they can really take off that year after that we'll go and do surveys to figure out percentage survival how tall those trees are just some standard metrics there are tons of bees in those units so i don't think they're as affected by say glyphosate than they are everything else like i said again glyphosate is an herbicide that affects plants and well i want to make an asterisk about glyphosate it doesn't kill them but uh a study showed from the university of texas in 2018 that honeybees so i imagine they're talking about i uh, i can't remember off the top of my head but i imagine they're talking about the european honeybees when they're exposed to glyphosate they lose good bacteria in their gut system uh, again bees are complicated creatures they're quite similar to humans actually in a weird way but when they lose the good bacteria in their guts, they become much more acceptable to being come infected by diseases, which can cause to death or the loss of the hive. So I don't think it's a uh, final nail in the coffin, but I think it definitely helps open the doorway to lose the hive, if that makes sense. I understand what you're saying, and I understand the science behind it is true. The thing about glyphosate is it's a very hot button topic, and we can do a podcast all about it. There is a ton of good science on it and a ton of terrible science on it. I'm sure everyone here has seen an ad saying glyphosate causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. If you or a loved one has been exposed, contact blah, blah, blah. That was based off of one terrible, terrible decision made by the World Health, or is it World, WHO, World Health Organization, that listed it as a possible carcinogen. Do you know what else they listed as a possible carcinogen? Red meat, air, salt. These are all things we eat on the regular day today or consume that are listed as a possible carcinogen. I think you're telling you're telling me the World Health Organization gets things wrong. Oh, no, that can't be true, Nick. No, exactly. And I deal with a lot of public outreach about this issue, and I've seen a lot of bad science. For example, people will take glyphosate and put it into a human cell at levels that would extreme levels you'd never be exposed to and so for example like i and they say you put this glyphosate in this human cell and it causes it to explode this human skin cell yeah but the level you put that in would be as if you took a bath in glyphosate for 24 hours and like it just doesn't make any sense um so it's a i don't i'm I, again, I haven't read the study. I'm s- skeptical to look at it, but we deal with environmentalists all the time, and it makes me very... I don't want to trust anything about glyphosate unless I read it because just the amount of 
terrible science and it's a lot of what they're doing is manipulating the amount applied and so when there's a constant like a concentration of it above what would be applied obviously it's going to do terrible things so that is is hard uh, like i I'm just, I, it's hard to debate without reading it, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, no, that's completely, that's completely fair. I, I mean, me and Nick do our own independent research, so we come across different things. I do want to say that I do agree with you that uh, when I came across Glass of Fate, there are some really good uses for it. Uh, just like, I, I just feel like it's a dual-edged sword. Sometimes it's good for some things, it's sometimes bad for the others. But uh, the the study I, the the one I'm talking about from the University of Texas, it had a pretty good sample size. And I like that they didn't say, oh, it can lead to death and stuff like that. It's like, no, it could just, it could damage that bacteria the and be make them more easily affected to be diseases. That, the the jump, I just want to make sure this clear, is between the study and me. These are two different things. I made the assumption that if they're more flexible diseases, that they could get more diseases. To me, that kind of puts one, one together. Uh, which then affect the hives because again, bees are complicated creatures. They can get infected by bacteria and viruses. So there's this really nasty one. I can't remember. I didn't want to even research it because it was just nasty that it's like a virus or bacteria that gets in their lungs and when it reproduces, it clogs up their lungs and makes them suffocate real nasty. But yeah. And so another good thing to point out with glyphosate, like we said, it's an herbicide. So not only when you apply it you're killing plants for that year it it's not a long-lasting herbicide so you're reducing their food source in a varied diet i'm assuming this applies to bees as well you're not going to be able to have access to all of the food and different nutrients that you previously had so that could be a factor in it too see i'm happy you brought up levels and concentration and we're still talking about pesticides and herbicides because i want to go back to the uh, nicotine based insecticide so the nicotine-based insecticide, which I cannot pronounce, so I'm just going to keep calling it that, based on how it's... All right, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna help you pronounce it. Neo, like the Matrix. Okay, I got that. I'm Neo. N- Nick, like my name. Okay, Neo Nick. It. Neo Nick it. In. Neo Nick it in. Oid. Neo Nicotinoid. Neo Nicotinoid. Neo Nicotinoid. All right, just say Neonix. <laughs> Neo, Neonix it is. I, oh, I'm dyslexic. But it was very interesting when I was researching that insecticide. I want to make sure that's clear. I'm, I'm trying, Nick. I'm trying to learn the difference and trying to make sure I say the difference between herbicide and insecticide. Uh, but for that insecticide, insecticide, when too much levels, which has happened quite a bit since 2006 to now, are into the plant. So pretty much what nico- the neonicotinoids are do is it produces enough of this insecticide throughout the entire plant where if a bug came up and bit it, it would die from the high doses of the leaf that is going throughout the entire plant system. Well, if it can affect and mix in with the pollen, which again then get will infect the bees. So neonicotinoids have poison bees where they end up dying or it can cause them to almost be like concussed like they can't communicate with their hive anymore they have no sense of direction they kind of fly wondrously they just kind of hover they're poisoned and high out of their mind and i believe if i remember correctly that connecticut and i think another east coast city outlawed it in their states uh, I'm not saying it's bad. I don't know the science behind it. Again, I'm not an expert. We're just two guys just drinking some whiskey and bourbon, talking about interesting science stuff. But again, I think it's just a dual-edged sword. There's a time and a place. So if it's right, so this is this is where I'll I'll interject here. Um, yeah, like you said, there's a time and a place. So like my buddy who has the bees it comes down like you said neonicotinoid it causes the bees to die which is exactly what it's supposed to do it's an insecticide it kills insects so your application needs to be before you bring those insects in now i understand the there's a danger to the native insect population 
and that's very true. However, we it's not you can't tell the farmers that you want all this food and make you not allow them to use these tools to control it because then what happens? In the US, you know, we use herbicides. That's the way we manage things. We don't have some crazy labor force that just we can control and make do all these different things. We need these pesticides to control all these different insect populations to keep the the train rolling, keep everyone fed. We can't do that without these tools. These tools can sometimes be dangerous. Now, these tools in the right hands, like Mike said, there's a, it's a double-edged sword. In the United States, we can use these tools better than any other country, and I very firmly believe that. Now, we are continually outlawing the use of these tools in this country, and that's not leading to a decrease in herbicide or pesticide use. It's leading to an increase in world pesticide use because the thing about pesticides it's like Mike said, it's a science, and it's it's super interesting to me uh, personally. But it can be dangerous. Now we can control that risk in the U.S. We have labels, we have all these rules and regulations, critical use periods for different birds and stuff, and just we take into account a lot that most countries do not take into account. So I think it's important to consider before. We ban anything in the U.S. like that, which we're considering to do in Portland and the rest of Oregon. They want to ban neonics and, you know, glyphosate's up on, not not seriously, but comes up every now and then because of the ads on TV, that we realize just because we don't do it in the U.S. doesn't mean it's going to stop it worldwide. And there's going to be worse outcomes if you let the rest of the world just go crazy with this stuff. Than when you let us in the U.S. apply it in a controlled manner, like we talked about earlier with the integrated pest management control, knowing at the threshold of is it worth it to do this application because these are not cheap by any means. These treatments. I want to bring up some points before we stray from that. Um, I've noticed with the yeah neonicotide. Did I do it good? Mm, close neonicotinoids. All right, close enough. Nicotinoids, nicotinoids. Okay, nicotinoids, 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 neonicotinoids. I noticed with the nicotinoids okay. that it's, I, <laughs> dude, I'm trying. I'm, I'm dude, good at just math. Do, just I, neo nix, neo matrix. My name, neo nix, neo nix. Can't. Um, it's all about the level. So you said it's an insecticide. Yeah, bees are gonna die from it. But from what I noticed researching this, it was the levels, based on the levels, it was affecting the pollen inside the plant. Usually, if produced at, not produced, uh, if applied at a lower level, it would still protect the plant, being an inside of some bug trying to eat its leaves, but not affect the pollen. The pollen is where the bees were getting really messed up. So, to me, that's extremely curious because pollen is I, I don't know the chemical construction of pollen but i imagine it's a protein based substance because it's you know you got to pollinate another thing with another pollination to grow another plant protein and a protein and bees eat it to turn it into byproducts of honey and to feed their youngs etc cetera, etc cetera. so when mixed with pollen i imagine the chemical composite of the neonix has to change a little bit which makes me wonder what herbicide and or insecticide that we've tested haven't tested with all the flowers and plants i mean yes i nick you've told me in past podcasts you should definitely go check those out that at uh backyard philosophy or anywhere you listen to podcasts but they do extensive million if not billion dollar studies on it but you can't catch everything i feel like that's just impossible it's to catch everything we're, we're, we're human we're not gods and when you start talking about the different levels it like say for example uh going back to uh glasophate glasophate is found in like common chemicals like roundup well if you're glyphosate is roundup so round glyphosate is the chemical name roundup is the brand name so it's essentially, it'd be like glyphosate is milk, 
and Lucerne is Roundup. Ah, okay. Thank you for the clarification. I did not know that. All right, we'll say I don't. I don't want to pick on Roundup because I assume other companies do it. But say Glasophate is used in a common spray that people can buy from Home Depot, Menards, or Lowe's, et cetera, et cetera. I imagine that adds up because if Bill sprays it and then his next door neighbor Ted sprays it and then his next door neighbor Rufus sprays it, I imagine that's got to add up a little bit to the quantity of being sprayed and that can heavily affect the local bee population. Now, I'm not saying that they're killing the bees, but I'm just saying if Bill, Ted, and Rufus, that's the back to uh, Bill and Ted reference for everyone out there i don't know if nick got that but it it makes me smile if they're spraying their local garden which i highly support that people plant flowers and plants that will help promote bees and help them grow uh if they're spraying that and the bees get infected by that and they go to the next door neighbor and get that sample and that sample it's got to be bad because they're getting three doses now it could be minute doses but those doses add up so again i think it's just Going back to a dual-edged sword, I think there's just other solutions. Now, I, I agree with you. What you said, Nick, was uh, do it during the non-pollination harvest season, like your friend well, did it before. So that's that's just a that's just a label thing. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the, la- the label comes with basically any pesticide you're going to use, and just like you can apply certain chemicals during certain seasons. With bees, you can apply certain pesticides to that hive to control different things based on what cycle of life they're in. So there's different, different. you can apply different pesticides to control the mites throughout the year, but it's you can't apply, you can't go against the label. If you do something that the label says you can't do, it's, it's against the law. It's a label violation and the uh, Department of Ag's going to come down on you. Um, so that the only reason I brought that up is just because there's a couple different ways to treat the varroa mites. Most of them are pesticide related, and there's only one or two that you can use during honey flow, which is when most people find the mites, which is the issue. But if you treat before and after, you get a different wider range of pesticides that you can use. And before we keep going, I know you had a point and I kind of interrupted you, but um, rate, like we talked about, is important how much you apply per acre, but also per year. Now, neonics, um, insecticides, aren't applied every year, which is they're applied when there's an issue. It's just part of your integrated pest management. If you figure out you have a problem, then you can apply your insecticide to take care of your whatever you're trying to get rid of, whatever pest you have. And it has a half-life of 34 days, which is when exposed to sunlight, which is pretty common for most pesticides. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be half, like, okay, yes, half of it will be gone in 34 days, but that doesn't mean it's all going to be gone in 68 days. It's going to remain around for a while, but not that long compared to most other things. No, I, I, I agree with you saying there's a time and a place, but I'm just saying there is, to me, there's a always a better solution. It's the engineering me of always to progress, always try to find a better solution, always try to improve. And I think the nicotine-based insecticides are not the right solution. I think they are good. So- I, I do love how you didn't even try it. <laughs> I, 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 I gave up. I, it's not, it's, yeah, it's not for me. Um, but I, I just think they're like a temporary fix until we find something better, which I, again, I, I, I'd like to see because – the nicotine-based insecticide tends to be more for the mites, from what I saw. I, I, can you concur, or am I just making that up in my mind? Um, yeah, it, it'll, it'll treat the mites. It'll treat other stuff. It, from what I've seen, is that it's, um, it's neonics aren't specifically applied for the mites. They're usually applied for something else. Yeah, they're usually applied to crops to help fend them off so they don't get chewed up and eat out. But like uh, it'll help with the mites but i i kind of forget where i was going with this topic but trying going back to the earlier topic i was talking about with the glyphosate is if you have three i'm I'm sad you didn't get the bill and ted reference um 
that actually hurt a lot uh if you have i don't know why when you said bill and ted i was thinking tucker and dale for whatever reason oh, so tucker and dale versus I evil think, such a good movie see this is we weren't on the same page at all we we, we are just not on the same page all oh wait until we get a little bit later in the podcast uh i imagine we're gonna butt heads even more but oh, can't wait uh <laughs> i imagine if neighbor a b and c are all spring roundup i'm just choosing a brand it doesn't it doesn't necessarily be that brand if they all spray it and a bee flies over to one flies over to the other flies over to the other even if it's my note doses that are been tested that it can pass having all those added effects because let's be honest people who are buying roundup or some herbicide they they probably don't have as much knowledge as you do like i don't have as much even close to knowledge as you do if i have like a but we buy it they, they don't sell the, the concentrate that we buy to normal people. It's already broken down for you. So you're already getting a diluted version of it. Yeah, but I imagine that diluted version adds up, especially if you're a B, because what, a B weighs 0.03 of a gram or something like that? Like Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. I think, uh, yeah, I think people definitely need to be more educated on using their own pesticides at home. I mean thing that people don't understand is how little of it how far it can go i mean like i said like for glyphosate we're going to apply it three quarts an acre so that's less than a gallon per acre um 96 ounces per acre if anyone cares but you know that's not a lot and i guarantee you treating around a house you're treating a lot less than an acre and I don't know at what percentage you're buying it, but you're probably applying it a little bit more than that. And like we mentioned earlier in the Invasive Species podcast, I think that just having green lawns and all this weed control and stuff like this is probably ecologically not good for the environment. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's something we did away with in the next 50 years. Oh, completely agree. The amount of, not just for bees, but the negative effect of humans disrupting how nature's supposed to be how negative it is for everything not like not just nature but civilization and communities etc cetera, etc cetera, is enormous like the amount of wildflowers for bees that used to be compared to now are they're it's they're not even comparable the numbers are destroyed compared to which is really interesting to think about and if you're okay with it. I would like to switch from insecticides and herbicides. I'll try it one more time. Neonicotoids and glyphosate. Did I, did I dig it good? It was rough. Um, oh. Yeah, no, for sure. But back, okay, one point. This is, I don't know if this is true or not. I mean, I know the data is true, but I don't know if this is the reason. Back to people having their own lawn or caring for their lawns. Uh, I was curious because people were saying that the reason there's glyphosate and imazapur in the water is because of forest runoff runoff from our forest grounds and it i looked it up and how much runoff there is and this is in like parts per trillion and there's i can't remember exactly but i do remember that there is more runoff like higher percentage of glyphosate and imazapur in the water outside of portland than there was outside of our forest grounds and I'm just having to guess that that's from over application from just private homeowners treating their grounds who don't have the knowledge of what they should be using. So I think it, that may play a part in it. And I I don't think that they're, they should be restricted from using those tools. But at the same time, I think that it's giving the rest of us who use them correctly a bad name. So it's kind of we're caught in the middle, I think. I, think a lot of that runoff you know we get ag, ag runoff gets blamed for a lot but i think com, like uh, in neighborhood runoff is an issue we don't talk about but is probably worse than well, some ag runoff i completely agree with that hypothesis i i to me that makes complete sense of someone who's not trained in it or not familiar with it overusing it that just uh, us humans we're disgusting creatures we unfortunately are very good at gluttony greed and all seven deadly sins. So I, ma- I imagine overusing some lawn care to kill some crabgrass or weeds or something like that. I yeah. I or, or dandelion, which is a 
a helpful um, helpful plant that bees kind of depend on. I like dandelions. I don't you dandelions are so useful. Like you can pretty much use every part of a dandelion for something. Wait, sorry, we're getting a little off topic. Actually, no. Actually, that might be a good transition into the topic I want to bring up with is how farmlands are set up. So if you were, I imagine a lot of people have uh, flown in a plane, they've looked outside the window, and they've seen flying across the Midwest that the amount of rows of crops, corn, soybeans, et cetera, wheat, et cetera, et cetera, and how compact and universal they are. Well, that tends to be kind of bad for the bees. It tends to starve out the bees. Imagine, so bees say, well, we'll say corn for uh, an example. Bees can't pollinate corn. They, they just, it's not in their biology. And because the farmer, say Tom, is trying to get as much out of his land, he removes all the weeds, all the flower, wild glass flowers, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's compact. Well, to that bee, it's now starving because now all the food around it is gone. Now, it's great for the farmer because it's organized, it's compact, it can more bang for his buck. But it's bad for the bees. So I was wondering, what's your before we discuss in more into it, what's your feeling on having farmers have more weeds like dandelions or more flowers that the bees like, or more cover crops. I, I really like to be talked about a lot about more of that. We talked about a little bit in the beginning, but I want to hear what your opinion is. So you're forgetting another very important part of bee population habitat. Most native bees in the U.S. Uh, resided in what we would call wildlife trees, old dead trees with large cavities in the middle from nesting birds or some kind of thing i mean we're all well, maybe we're not all familiar maybe it's just out here but just think of the big old dead oak tree that's got some big hole in the middle and that's where all the birds fly out of or the bats or whatever well that's where bees like to live and when people first moved to north america bee hunters used to be an actual profession and almost an art form and colonists would they what they would do is they'd put like sugar and they'd put uh, a bunch of powdered sugar on there or sugar for the bees to attract the bees, some kind of sugar solution, and then powdered sugar. And the bees would get all in the powdered sugar and they'd just follow that powdered sugar back to the hive. They'd smoke out the bees and take the hive. Um, and that's how they'd get honey if they didn't have their own bee population. And bees used to be very plentiful and they lived in these old dead and down trees. So... Uh, you know now those acres of used to be forests are now uh, corn and that's where we're at now there's you know it's going to take years before you can get back to that native dead and down or dead and upright snags as we'd call them now you can still look at pretty much uh they sell them all over the midwest you can order fake habitat kind of hives for different species of bees in your area that these bees that that simulate these places that they lived so i i think habitat loss is worse than uh you know so say they can't pollinate corn well they can't live in corn either so i think that's a bigger issue than not being able to pollinate i i i would put them both on equal footing um just to, to address what you just said there for uh, ordering bees. You can order bees and ladybugs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, from what I've noticed for ordering bees, it tends to be that European honeybee, which is kind of more desirable because, like, the local hobbyist bee, uh, beekeeper wants, you know, a honeybee to make meat or just put honey in a jar, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I yeah, so sorry. I think – you misheard me. So I wasn't ordering, uh, this wasn't ordering bees. This is ordering a simulated hive. So this is mostly for like carpenter bees where I ran this across because carpenter bees like to burrow in the wood. Well, there's not a lot of wood left in the Midwest in places. And so this makes it so it attracts them to that instead of a house, which is a local bee, the carpenter bee. 
So it increases the local bee population, their native bee population, but also keeps the bees out of your house. It seemed like a pretty popular solution. Oh, no, I, I completely understood what you're saying. I was just kind of making a clarification. Like I, like I said, I think the habitat and food are both on equal footing to me. Because like, if you have a home, but you can't eat, you're screwed. If you can eat, but you don't have a home, you're screwed. So it, to me, they're one and the same. They're equal. But again, going back to bees being kind of complex little little livestock is you can't just feed them the same thing like say say i chose middle of indiana and i'm a soybean farmer and i want to have some bees so i throw in some dandelions just you know as a cover crop for part of my section uh we were just talking dandelions earlier so that's just popped in my head uh well that might not just be good because bees need not a complex diet, but a varying diet. They can't just have, if they have just one plant where they're getting their pollen and nectar from, they tend not to do well and they tend to become sickly and they tend not to thrive as well as they would if they had a choice of what their nectar is coming from, from different various species. So going back, if you look at a farmland of a house, crop, maybe... A silo, a barn, et cetera, et cetera, but no flowers, no weeds, no habitat, the bees screwed. They're starving to death. They have nowhere to go. They're homeless. And I think I'm hoping that will change in farmland America of having bees be more intertwined together. Now, no one likes being stung. It it hurts. I've been stung. I, Nick, you've been stung. Pro- probably been stung more than I have, to be honest. I think I have... Uh... PTSD from bees. Anytime I hear a faint buzzing, I kind of start moving away and or running. I know what your new ringtone is going to be, but there's a uh, there's a, a a meme that goes around the firefighting community, and it's all like a forest that's on fire and some dude running, and it just says bees, because there is it's there's nothing worse than bees. I. I hate bees. I hate getting stung. I get stung all the time. They're little assholes. <laughs> and all these videos of people just like going up to their beehive and just touching it without a suit on. I don't know what kind of bees they have, but I have yet to come in contact with any of those nice bees. Oh, I, I imagine they have to smoke those bees, right? They can't They can't just done that naturally. They had to like smoke the bees, then gone over to them. Yeah, I don't know. F- fuck bees and fuck wasps more fun fact this is a uh, this is way off topic i'm not going to talk but bees come from wasps so way back in the day before there was flowers there were um actually it might have been right when flowers came to existence uh there was a wasp the wasps like to eat bugs it, uh bees come from a carnivorous uh, carnivorous wasp so this wasp would collect uh, insects and put them in a hole and eat them when they're hungry, et cetera, et cetera. Go out, kill them all. Well, the wasp realized that the insects they killed that were near pollen and nectar, not, not nectar, pollen, just pollen yet. Nectar hasn't come along. Just pollen, they liked better because it was higher in protein. They could eat more, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, evolution, biology happened, and that carnivorous wasp went wait a minute i don't have to eat other insects i can just eat the pollen so you kind of get the first vegetarian insect which is well not insect vegetarian bee which is weird to think about that the same assholes which are wasps are all related to bees who are also assholes bees are great from a distance i bet that vegetarian wasp never shut the fuck up about it either (laughs) <laughs> now nah, nick play nice <laughs> oh you you speak the true true there's no there's no doubting about it uh but uh where were we? we were talking about uh how farmers and areas don't have cover plots there's not enough flowers there's not enough plants and I, I just think that's true. I, if you don't have a habitat, if you don't have enough food, it, it's a species is not going to survive. So maybe we have to switch up farming a little bit. Now, 
I don't want to disrupt a farmer. I've never been a farmer. I don't know what goes into it. But if, say, a section of your land, like, say, the edges by the street where it doesn't, like, you can't really use your harvester to collect crops, imagine you plant wildflowers around the edges. I imagine that's got to be pretty good for the bee population, and it doesn't affect your uh, crops. I think that's a win-win. I'm just trying to find a compromise there because... So like, I'm not going to... Here's an idea. What if we have a federal program that gives landowners or farmers a payment to take some of their acreage out of production and turn it back into native ground? Don't we already do that? Don't we already pay farmers not to grow crops, at least certain crops? Yes, that's what I was getting to. That is the conservation reserve program see i know something crp look at you so yeah we kind of do do that but also i think um so what you're talking about uh what's it called by basically the edge of fields and that's where you're going to have you're going to have natural flowers or a lot of times that's where invasive species tend to congregate the disturbed soil right on the edge of a road but most of the time there are flowering plants and I don't know any farmers who don't have their own garden, like a good sized garden, like a pretty decent garden with a variety of flowers. Clearly, you've not been so, to Indiana. Well, I've driven through it, and I think that was enough. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, I, I, I would. No, basically, that's that's my point. I, no, I, I would agree that most, most, I would agree that most farmers want to be self-sustainable that they have their own garden, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe that garden isn't enough because how much, how much land can a home garden have that's not their crop? But I imagine if, say, say a person has 12 acres and that's their plot size, all around that border and then the same for their neighbor and the same for their neighbor and the same for their neighbor, that's going to add up quite quickly. Now, like we said, so let's bring it into my field so we're not telling farmers what to do. So we've had this discussion in our industry at a conference. We talked about there's a company, I'll give them a shout out, Hampton Lumber. Um, I don't know why I'm shouting them out. They didn't hire me for a job. Actually, fuck those guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um Anyway, what they do in some of their timberland is during their beginning stages of their stand. So when their trees, year after planting, two years after planting, they'll actually plant native wildflowers to increase um, pollinator habitat. And it's the exact opposite of what you would want to do because you're diverting water away from your crop. Like that's so it's a you're gaining a lot in pr you know it's the the way i see it is it's not worth it you're because you're you're losing those first few years of your stands life that's your it's when your trees are the most fragile they're not completely established they don't have the root system they don't have the you know the reserves of energy and instead of trying to reduce their competition you're increasing it and you're paying for it and their whole thing is they're trying to buy more goodwill they happen to operate in a section of oregon that is a lot less timber friendly now we're far away and we're still not operating in timber friendly areas but a lot of people understand the need but they're closer to say uh portland very timber unfriendly so they're trying to buy that goodwill but here's what i've seen there's not a lot of people who are in between on timber harvesting so you could try and force these farmers to do it which is only grow resentment but if it's it's kind of it it sucks because yeah like don't get me wrong that maybe it's the right thing to do it's a good thing to do but you're not buying yourself anything because you're going to have flowering plants here anyway. You may not have the... Va usually it's daffodils or 
you know, Senecio, I mean, tons of different plants depending on the area. I don't want to try and extrapolate to the rest of Oregon and what flowering plants are seeing, but these guys are actually going out and buying native seed, which is, is good, and it, it should build goodwill, but it doesn't. They haven't, it doesn't seem like it's paid off for them. Now, I wouldn't be opposed to trying, like, do, you have to do some kind of massive PR campaign, and someone would maybe like, uh, okay, so here's an idea. Hear me out. It's going to be a little stretch, even though I've been monologuing for the past 15 minutes, it seems like. No, keep going, keep going. So you're familiar with carbon credits? Yes. Okay, they're bullshit. Yeah. Anyway, um, we'll get that's a whole separate podcast, and don't ever purchase them. It's stupid. Now, how about instead of those carbon credits? Oh, you can't see the air quotes. This doesn't work. Going to some corporation where they basically just keep all that money for themselves. You have set up something where this you do, you purchase what would be say um. Uh, crop offset pollinator habitat ground and and you know same way set up with carbon credits if you're going on a plane you can purchase them or whatever if you feel bad or want to donate to habitat so before hang on hang on hang on before you continue you're saying instead of carbon credits you can say this money's going towards a habitat for native species yes okay just making sure just clarifying yeah. and so what you do is you basically you could purchase, but probably more likely you'll rent ground from a farmer for, say, five years or so, or maybe purchase the ground. I don't know. Whatever, you know, it depends on the area if they're willing to sell, blah, blah, blah. And maybe you just purchase an acre, and you turn that acre, turn it back into some good bee habitat. You're, you know, grow a few trees, pretty scattered, but predominantly focus on... Uh, bringing wildflowers back and you'd have to have someone manage that you know maybe that could fall under some kind of federal land management program i mean they got enough land managers giving them a few more acres probably can't hurt them but you're not going to get the best management out of them so maybe this is the perfect opportunity for some kind of third independent party to come in and basically make a a non-for-profit maybe that does something like this that's where I see it going. I, I don't want to see another federal government program to do this, but if we did something like that where people aren't forced to pay, pay into it, you're not forcing farmers to do anything, but you're having someone bring bees back and paying for the land to do it. Even um, state programs, uh, state they eventually have enough money to buy land back. Or, now here's a thought, and just... This is crazy, but the national forests, different from national parks, Teddy Roosevelt specifically wanted them to produce an income that could pay for national parks so that all Americans could go to visit it. Well, they're not really doing that right now. They're basically seeing the same as national parks. What if we use those timber dollars, we cut down some trees in the, the national forest, which is what they were originally designed to do, increase some habitat because flowers don't grow in dark forests use that money to buy some farmland back in the middle of a farm field and start growing some native species i mean i'd be doing for that i definitely see there's a there's definitely a compromise here of having what you want and doing the work to get it I, there's definitely a compromise here like I, I i like teddy roosevelt he's my favorite president of all time i mean bull moose go bull moose uh, but yeah, if it's if we make national parks more not, not necessarily profitable, but self sustaining. No, sorry. So there's there's two. So national parks you don't touch. That was in the original. That's nature. National forests are forests owned by the state or by the government, the federal government, for the purpose of providing income to the government to pay for national parks so that people don't have to pay to get in national parks. Teddy Roosevelt was very clear that he didn't want people to have to pay to get in national parks. He wanted every single American to be able to go into the national parks for free, no matter... He didn't want a barrier for people going into the outside, which is what we have now. You have to buy a parks pass. It's a completely separate topic. Not 
terrible management. Government ruined it. Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Short. So that's a summation of my argument. No, I there. mean, there's definitely some valid points there. There's a, definitely a compromise of finding a good balance. Because I, I don't think the American, not American, I keep saying American honeybee, the European honeybee, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. I think most of the world uses it. Yes, there was some worrisome, but I think it's, from what I saw from researching it, it's kind of balanced out. It's the native bees I'm most scared of because those wild native bees, the wild bees, they probably add an effect to the ecosystem that's kind of hard to measure. It's They're important. In an ecosystem, it, nature always finds a way, but an ecosystem is still delicate. So when we start messing with it. All right, so here's, here's another thing. So remember in Invasive Species, we talked about the... Oh, shoot. Um, American chestnut and how they were extinct because of a, a blight from, I can't remember if it was Europe or Asia, I want to say Europe. And they reintroduced them by crossbreeding with the European and Asian chestnut. But then recently they sliced the genes from wheat to codes for rust resistance into the American chestnut and brought it back. Well, maybe that's our best course of action for these native bees is, like I said, it's all about genetics at the end of the day pesticides is a crutch to keep them along but if we can create a genetically superior a native honeybee then we don't need to worry about the mites and the insecticides and all this stuff if we can make that be genetically safer from everything else yes and no so i like crispr to me like genetic engineering it, that's <laughs> funny enough genetic engineering is like a godsend like it's it's there to save the species but I still also at the same time like in keeping things au naturel. Like just letting, because nature's so good at figuring how to, how to do things. And I imagine a lot of bee loss uh, from the 40s after the World War II to now is loss of habitat, as you pointed out, of we're making cement barriers, new cities, skyscrapers, et cetera, et cetera. And also, you know, the new type of farming to keep up with the food production of growing population. But if we could find a compromise of, yes, I don't want the species to go extinct. So if we have to keep them alive through genetic engineering, I'm down. But if we could find a way where we sacrifice a little for a greater good, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I would prefer to support it, but I don't know enough facts or evidence about it to back that up. To me, just having small natural habitats like national forests, as Nick pointed out, allowing bees to, not just bees, but nature to be how it's supposed to be in that area sounds very beneficial to me. And I don't like seeing species that go extinct, even if it's an insect, even if it's an insect that stings me. And I say a lot of curse words when they sting me, the little fucks. But... I still don't want them to go extinct. I because we got because there are many different types of bees. Because some live in the ground, some live in the uh, rotted out trees, as Nick pointed out. They they have a whole range of habitat. So if we could find a compromise for each one, small sections, maybe we sacri like uh, I really like the idea of instead of carbon uh, pay carbon payments, you pay for land to help support it, like a third party or a charity. I like that idea a lot, and I I hopefully. With other implementations, it'd be good to proceed with that. Just trying, just trying to find compromises and a way to do that because bees are so important. Like we've talked about how we need them for food, almonds, uh, plants, tomatoes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the end of the day, in the United States alone, there bees are estimated to be worth fifteen billion dollars annually to help pollinate, to help get, to help uh, get honey. To help, it's just bees are worth a lot. And, again, they're complex creatures. We haven't really talked about it, but I, I, you're willing, Nick, I would like to talk about diseases for bees. Yeah, let's, uh, let's get after it. So, for me, there were two major diseases. One that would affect the lungs and one that would affect the larva. So, there was one that the, it would affect the larva where the larva just turned to goop. It would just be, it just turned the babies into liquid and destroy it and the other one would suffocate them 
uh, suffocate the bees uh, when the viruses and bacteria were laying uh, were laying eggs or reproducing in their lungs. And a that's scary to think about. But b they are as simple as bees are. They are also complex organisms. So when a hive gets decimated, usually a queen can live because again, a queen's a little bit more cleaner, et cetera, et cetera, and can leave to another hive. But when she starts a new hive, she might carry that disease and just not transmit it as well because it might affect her longer, et cetera, et cetera. And these diseases are just affecting them heavily. Like it doesn't have to be just killing them. Like stress in bees is an actual real thing. Like going back to the almonds, kind of tying disease and 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 traveling together is the stress. I imagine the high stress for the bees of traveling cross country to pollinate some almonds in California, or the stress of knowing that some of your some of the bees got infected with a virus and you're trying to kick those bees out or trying to make those bees leave or those bees are leaving. That's got to be harmful for the entire hive to feel that kind of stress. And it's, it's interesting to me how complex and how intricate the bees are. And uh, I don't know if you came uh, across any of this, Nick. Yeah, well, I mean, for sure I did. And I, that's why I love my field. I love working in nature because it's a science. We, if you research enough, you can get answers. But it's also, it's not because there's so many answers we don't know. So many things are not connected a lot of what we're doing now is guesswork, even in our modern day and age, about how exactly these different levels of the food chain interact and how these diseases affect not just the bees, but everything above them. It's We can guess. We make pretty good guesses, but it is we don't have a for sure science of every single thing that this affects and what how the bee population affects this and that. And it's one of those things where we probably won't know till it's too late but yeah like we talked about with diseases is it's not i mean obviously it's not good but there's so many different kinds of diseases that come over especially like we talked about invasive species where you have say european honeybees are resistant to this disease or kind of like we are with the say the flu or something where yeah we're not resistant to this strain but we've had in the past so we're going to fare better than someone who hasn't had it kind of the same say any disease when uh the new world was settled and that the colonists or the settlers brought over the conquistadors like chicken pox yeah like chicken pox and it decimated that unprepared population which is the native population is getting destroyed by invasive diseases which you know it's an invasive species it's not here they have no defense against it and no matter if you have the habitat, all this stuff, there's really no way they can defend against it because their immune system can't handle it. So they can live a stress-free life. I mean, if, you know, a lot of times stress allows the disease to get in. So like if you're a tree and there's drought or you suffer physical damage, the inside is exposed to the outside, you have some kind of physical stressor that that disease that vector comes in but with bees that have immune systems like us something that's spread like that it can be anything you can just come in contact with the european honeybee pollinating the same flower or whatever they leave it there and you bring it back to your hive and that's it's kind of it so like i said earlier genetics i think is such a huge role you know, we don't want to compromise the genetic diversity of our native honeybee population because that could be part of their, you know, that's that's a big part of the honeybee population of keep maintaining that genetic diversity is important. But if we go through a bottleneck effect where, say, 90% of American honeybees are eliminated because of this disease, then you only have 10% of that left, so only 10% of that genetic diversity is maintained you know, we lost all that genetic diversity anyway. So I think we should be looking into some kind of genetic resistance, breeding bees, breeding native bees that are resistant to it, and then having them 
breed with these other species because we're not going to be able to get rid of a disease. That's not something we can do. No, but you hit. All right. So you hit on a bunch of points there. I want to I want to start single them out. One with the stress and disease. Yes. When a plant or an animal or uh, when something's introduced to stress, it's more susceptible to getting diseases and bacteria. So I imagine when a bee, say, from Florida goes from Florida to California, it's traveling distance in a going through lands that normally wouldn't go through. Say, say it, we're not just talking about the European bee that's here in America or say we're say there are some native bees in there. Maybe I don't I don't exactly know, to be honest with all of you, but traveling to a new spot that's got to be stressful, introducing with thousands and thousands of new bees that could be infected could infect you could be a huge huge point of why bees are getting infected with bacteria and viruses because it's it's not just one disease and uh, another point that you brought up that i want to alliterate to everyone that it's so important bees the the disappearing of the bees is not just one problem it's a lot they're all connected the habitat, the diseases, the mites, the the food, their the pollution, the climate, they're all connected of how they're affecting the bees, which is huge to think about because it's not just one fix one problem and it's all solved. There's a lot of problems to be fixed. It's a it's definitely a rough ride to get it fixed all uh, all up. What Yeah, bees remind me a lot of salmon. It's they have a lot of variables working against them. Oh, yes, uh, definitely. And I definitely want to do a shout out to a Maria Spentvik. She's at the University of Minnesota, I believe. When researching her, uh, researching, she came up quite a bit. And uh, I highly recommend you all go to the University of Minnesota to look up Maria about her uh, and the bees because she kind of reminds me of the Jane Goodall of bees, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> She's uh, she's very passionate about it, and she brings up a lot of interesting points. And I like her her scientific work, which is quite interesting because it, it, she she really establishes that it's not just one thing. It's if a queen's not feeling good, the hive will do bad. If there's diseases, they'll do bad. If there's a bacterial infection to the hive itself, not just the bees, it's, it'll do bad. If there's not enough types of food, it, all the pollutions, because like. Bees in New York City. So uh, I, I believe we talked about this off air, but there were bees in New York City or it could have been New Jersey that were producing green, blue, and like red honey, which is honey is not supposed to look that color. Well, the honey they eventually found out were caused because the bees found out where this candy factory was being produced. And they were going to the candy factory to get all their sugar and nectar and it was called all these dyes were causing the honey to change colors which i don't think is edible i could be mistaken but i'll be honest that i don't think i want to try that honey i'll be i'll be i'll stick with the good old wildflowers by the side of the road <laughs> kind of honey yeah that's uh yeah i didn't run into that um but like we talked about out here uh honeybee you know, it seems like out here by us, everyone has a honeybees and chickens now. Like it's very common. I know a few people who started managing their own honeybee farms, and they seem to be doing good so far. You know, one of them is in Florida, and so we'll see how that goes because that's where a lot of the the issues are. But man, Florida just keeps coming. Florida just keeps coming up again and again, man. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. Oh, uh, I'm going with curse. I'll be straightforward. I think that's just <laughs> I think it's a curse. But uh, you did remind me something of earlier in your monologue that I wanted to address. I'm wondering because I I didn't research it or I I just came up with it, but I'm wondering how foreign plants or foreign species affect the beehives. Like having an invasive species that has a flower, how does that affect the bees does that pollen different is it more toxic is it bring other attributes to the bees is there different chemicals in that pollen i i'm very curious of how 
native bees would affect to invasive species flowers? I don't not I didn't come across anything. Did you come across anything? Um nothing that I read uh I know personally now I'm not a bee biologist. I'm not a entomologist. I I couldn't tell you a native bee from a invasive bee by looking at it, but working out in the woods, it doesn't seem like bees have any problem pollinating invasive species. I see them on blackberries and scotch broom and gorse, pretty much any flowering plant I've seen them on. I, it, it doesn't seem like they prefer it over natives, but it doesn't seem like they prefer natives over invasives. It seems like they see a bright flower and see it in ultraviolet or whatever, and they go to it. It doesn't seem like they're prioritizing one or the other. Now, I, again, I couldn't tell you if those are native bees that I'm seeing, but... It seems like they're pollinating pretty much any plant that's out there. You know, I see a lot of them on dandelion. It seems to be, you know, one, one of the pretty common. But that's also, you're more likely to see a dandelion than any other plant. So it's it's not the best example. Well, dandelions are native to Eurasia and North America. But that is that is good news. Even if it's, even if it's false hope, that's good news that the bees might do well with invasive species and plants so at least the bees don't have that going against them even though they are they pretty got a good stack of cards against them already but another point which i think is where we might butt heads is the effect that climate change is having on bee population now i'm not sure if there's anything else you want to talk about about currently what we talked before we get into this subject or Shall I just jump in with my hypothesis? No, I think we kind of wrapped up everything before that. So let's keep uh, moving on ahead or changing it up like the ozone layer likes to do. <laughs> Good old spray cans. But to me, it made sense. I came across this hypothesis. I It's a very new hypothesis from what I could tell. I think the article I read, I believe, was 2017. So I'm not sure how much research has been done on it. It's only three years of ish age of when this is being recorded. Uh, but their hypothesis was because the climate is changing and it's getting warmer earlier or warmer later, that it's changing when flowers and plants bloom. And from what they've said is bees are not adjusting as well as other insects to that. So bees are still doing the same cycle, but as the climate warms, they are not adjusting to it. So flowers will bloom earlier, but the bees aren't getting ready to go take care of that after hibernation. Huh. That's I, I never looked into it. Disclaimer. Um, well, I'm just wondering what your opinion of that, because we, we've talked about in earlier podcasts, which you could definitely go check out at Anywhere You List podcast or on YouTube at Backyard Philosophy, but we've talked about it in other podcasts how warmer climates is moving more north and i imagine that's affecting the seasons and i right so plants respond to temperature variations so basically they'll respond to levels of like days since last freeze kind of stuff like that so i'm wondering if i guess are bees driven by moon phases or how do bees decide to start their season? I'm not sure, but I don't know how bees start or adjust their cycle, which I'd be very curious about. Because to me, that kind of made sense. Like, if you have a, like, I, I know for a lot of plants, if there's a sun warmth and then immediate freeze afterwards, it's going to be a hard season because, you know, those plants didn't really have a chance and they got wiped out. So I'm wondering if it's the same because plants tend to, I think, adjust better in my opinion than animals and insects at least from my small narrow brain uh perspective well yeah i i could see that because plants are going to have multiple um oh shoot offsprings compared to bees bees will reproduce maybe once or twice a season i believe not entirely sure but i you know plants you're going to have very, very genetics based on pollination 
So yeah, it's probably easier for them to adapt to changing climate than bees if they have one or two offsprings per plant, whereas a plant can have a ton of offsprings and the best one's going to survive. But it's looking like... Cause that, Keep going. That, that just It just makes sense to me that not all species will adjust to the new climate. And I don't know why we would all think just bees would adjust the new climate that's happening and it's it it just i'd be very interested in more research on the hypothesis because it kind of makes sense to me of like hey if everything's blooming instead of may now they're blooming in march and the bees usually come around may well they've missed two months and they possibly missed the reproduction cycle of those flowers and plants so they're out of luck so that means there's less food there's less they have to compete more. There's they can't feed as much more. They can't grow, and it, it just seems very interesting to me that not all species will adapt to the new climbing change that we've caused. Yeah. Now, yeah, I don't have I can't decide one way or the other where I lean. Um, I would say a shorter season or a shorter winter. Sh- Ideally, you would think it would help the bees more because they use that honey to survive over the winter for food. So if they are storing enough honey for a traditional winter and that winter is shorter, they should have a surplus of food. But I don't know if maybe... it's it, From what I'm reading is it sounds like bees are based off temperature as well. I don't know exactly know what temperature signals are getting, but they should be able to... I'm assuming it's pretty close to flowers or plants based on your last how many days without cold kind of deal and when they start to heat up and shut down, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that's an interesting hypothesis, though. Well, I do I, I do know that bees, like, like a lot of them are, like you, we said, greenhouses are shipped down south because it depends on the levels it gets to freezing for when they uh hibernate so i'm wondering if the warmer temperatures are messing up their hibrate uh uh hibration cycle like they're not sleeping as well or they're entering their uh they're going to hibernation later because it's warmer season so they could be sleeping longer so say Say, I, I, again, I'm not a bee expert. I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm just throwing out crazy ideas. So say a bee naturally has four to six months of just like, hey, I need to sleep. It's, it's just random periods, just random numbers I chose. But it keeps going later and later. So instead of going to sleep in October, they're going to sleep in November. And they still have to do those couple months that they stay in hibernation and so instead of instead of getting those freezing colds because with climate change you get those freezing you you get various temperatures it's not always warm sometimes you get harsh winters sometimes you get hurricanes sometimes it's various temperatures so i'm wondering if that plays more of an effect on it like just their cycle is being shifted differently to plants instead of just being weather oriented they're also time-based hibernation does that make any sense or am i just talking crazy no, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, what I from from what I heard you say, and maybe I heard you wrong. It almost seems like the biggest disadvantage would be bringing them down south for the winter, where they don't really go into a hibernation, where they probably should be in hibernation. I, I that might be a fact. I have no evidence or no idea back that it back that up, but that kind of makes sense to me if you're messing with a natural cycle i imagine that's got to be negatory in some way i it might be minor it could be nothing or it could be something i it's just it's just interesting to me yeah now yeah i'd love to talk more about it it is it is a super interesting theory i just i don't know i would i would say i don't know enough to give you a a decent answer i'd say if you're curious that's something that listeners should go and look up for themselves because i don't want to comment on something that i i can guess at but man i it'd be a far-reaching guess it but i do like the hypothesis that's a very i i'm gonna be honest mike i didn't really run into too much about climate change affecting affect how it affects bees so that's an interesting one 
hey, maybe in the future we uh, we bring on a B expert. What what are they called again? Aperist, I believe. Maybe we bring on an Aperist one of these days and uh, actually get someone who's way smarter than us in this subject to talk about it. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. Like I mentioned previously, how um, a lot of say in Oregon, um, lack of better terms, hippies are growing bees to bring them back. You're not doing yourself any good by not using pesticides and buying strange building materials from the internet. And basically, don't. when we post sources, it just means we listen to them and maybe took some ideas from them. It doesn't mean we believe everything we say. That's all I'm saying. Uh, if you go through and look at some of our sources... Like, I listened to this guy talk about how this building material, Shungite, was going to change everything and how genetics wasn't a factor and you really don't need to worry about that and his thing was all you needed to protect yourself from all these different diseases and blah, blah, blah. So do your own research, but I'm pretty sure this guy's full of shit. (laughs) If there's one thing I've learned in growing anything, it's genetics is basically the beginning and the end. In the middle, you your management's going to make have a pretty decent effect but if you have shit genetics there's not a lot you can do yeah uh, again we all we are not experts in this field but i definitely do the research because i highly encourage people to plant native flowers and if you're not good if you don't have a green thumb a green thumb fine there are lots of uh, weeds that are beneficial to bees plant those they'll take care of themselves and if uh, neighbors start complaining, going, oh, I'm helping the bee population, I'll shut them up real fast. Because there's like certain uh, minerals in, uh, on those weeds that they are good for the structure of the hive or good for the bees. So just, uh, again, do your own research. We, <laughs> we don't know jack shit. We just, we just, a blind squirrel finds a nut. We just keep trying. Yeah. And... While you're planting weeds, don't plant any invasive species. Yes. Make sure they are native and they are helpful to the environment. Be consistent. It just do, do your research. We keep we keep saying it. Nick hit the nail on the head. Just do your research. So We'll guide you in the right direction. If you believe us, believe us. I think you should. I think we did a pretty good job of covering our bases. And we weren't trying to tell you anything we didn't know. Like I didn't really want to comment on the climate thing because like i said i i don't know and it didn't seem like mike was trying to prove a point that he didn't know either on the climate change thing it's just something he ran across and none of us were too sure about but it's an interesting point he brought up and you know we discussed a little bit but I, I like to think we're not that full of shit but you know we're also not experts so we're well-meaning idiots <laughs> hey if they use ladybugs i want some credit <laughs> Uh, well, I want to thank you all for listening to this episode of Backyard Philosophy, and I hope we could help inform you about how to save the bees and what are affecting the bees, because like we said in the beginning, bees are heavily influenced in our lives. And Nick, where can they find us on uh, Instagram? Backyard Philosophy on Instagram, Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook, and we don't have a Twitter because it's a dumpster fire. Oh, I love that. I love when you say it. Twitter's a dumpster fire. Well, that's all for me. I want to say thank you all for listening. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.